Okay. Uh, welcome to the sixth meeting in 2016 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones or at least uh, have them on silent. Uh, you may notice some members of the uh, committee consulting tablets which they use for the digitally available papers. Agenda item one is about decision on taking business in private. First item is to consider taking item seven, uh, correspondence from the SRUC in private. Uh, we're also asked to agree to take our consideration of our draft legacy p uh, report in private at future meetings. Do the members agree that we should do so? We are agreed. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is uh, about uh, subordinate legislation and the committee will take evidence on the Air Quality Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016 draft and welcome the Minister, Dr Aileen MacLeod, Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Neil Ritchie, Branch Head, Natural Assets and Flooding and Andrew Taylor, Air Quality Policy Manager. Uh, good morning. Minister, do you wish to speak to the instrument? Uh, thank you, Convener, and I'm delighted to be here this morning as the committee considers these draft regulations, which I hope will make an important contribution to our ongoing efforts to tackle air pollution. We have made uh, significant progress in improving air quality over recent decades. Emissions from our industrial and domestic sources have been reduced through tighter controls, as have emissions from transport through increasingly stringent fuel and exhaust emission standards. However, pockets of poorer air quality remain in many of Scotland's towns and cities. In almost all cases, transport is the cause as the increasing number of vehicles on our roads continues to outpace technological improvements. But unlike the dark smoke belching from factory chimneys and houses in previous times, these pollutants, which include uh, fine particulate matter and nitrogen oxides, are largely invisible, but they are no less significant in terms of their impact on human health. Although uh, poor air quality affects all of us, vulnerable groups in society are disproportionately affected, the very young, the elderly and those with existing respiratory and cardiovascular conditions. The Scottish Government is therefore determined to build on our achievements to date and to drive down pollution levels still further. In November last year, we launched Cleaner Air for Scotland, the Road to a Healthier Future, which is Scotland's first distinct air quality strategy, and it sets out a long-term vision for us to have the best air quality in Europe. And one of the long list of actions in Cleaner Air for Scotland is a commitment to introduce a mandatory objective for fine particulate matter known as PM2.5. And this is the subject of the regulations that we are considering this morning. An increasing body of scientific evidence shows that PM2.5 is one of the most significant air pollutants in terms of its impact on human health. And based on this evidence, uh, we have decided to adopt the World Health Organization's guideline value for PM2.5 in Scottish legislation, making us the first country in Europe to do so. Achieving this will be challenging, but it does underline our commitment to continue delivering improvements in air quality in Scotland. And I would ask the committee to support this instrument. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, members if they wish to comment. Sarah Boyack. Very much, Convener. Um, yesterday, um, there was a report out um, saying that 40,000 people across the UK will die early deaths because of air pollution. And I was wondering if you could spell out for us, Minister, the particular impact, impact of PM 2.5 and how that affects people's health and what difference this regulation will actually make in practice um, in terms of our cars, our lorries, our buses and the vehicles, um, particularly in our cities where we've got failures on air quality management areas. And I'm just really wanting to get what difference this will make in practice and how this will impact on logistics industry and people with um, cars that we use in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, thanks. 
Um, well, obviously, one of the things that um, the data published in 2014 by Public Health England covering the whole of the UK suggested that around uh, 2,000 premature deaths each year in Scotland may be associated with PM 2.5 uh, pollution. So the new objective will provide a focus uh, for addressing uh, this issue, but obviously there's going to be a need to obviously increase the number of PM 2.5 uh, monitoring uh, stations as well. In a consultation on the proposals, they did generate overwhelming support and recognition uh, of the Scottish Government's commitment to deliver uh, further improvements in air quality. And I think I'll hand over to Andrew. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the important thing about PM2.5 in, in health terms is that these particles are obviously very small and they, penet they penetrate deeply into the lung and cause respiratory and cardiovascular problems. The, lar the larger particles tend to be filtered out before, before, they, before they get to that stage. So there's an overwhelming body of evidence that shows that PM2.5 does have significant health impacts. And as the Minister has just said, introducing this new objective is going to give us a focus for, um, for tackling that pollutant in the future. Up until now, we haven't had a legal objective in Scotland for addressing PM2.5. And by bringing this objective into regulations, it gives us an impetus for, for taking action. It, provide, it puts a responsibility on local authorities to monitor for the pollutant, to um, try and assess what kind of levels of PM2.5 pollution they have in their areas and then once those figures are available it provides a focus for taking action and introducing measures into local air quality action plans that are going to tackle this important pollutant and if um, PM2.5 is similar to other pollutants which we tackle at the moment which it's likely to be then its major source is likely to be transport so a lot of the focus of the action actions that that are taken will be to reduce, um, try and reduce pollutant levels from, from transport emissions. I can I just also add, um, convener? Um, obviously, I think it's you know it's set out um, within the cleaner air for Scotland strategy as well. You know, a whole uh, series of actions for over the short term, the medium term, and the long term. You know, and specifically in relation, obviously, in relation to health. Um, the fact that we are including in legislation is Scottish objectives, the World Health Organisation guidelines values um, for PM10 and PM2.5. We'll also be requiring our NHS boards and the local authority partners to include reference to air quality and health in the next revision of their joint health protection plans, which should identify and address specific uh, local priority issues. And obviously, of course, we have, have a long list of actions that will be taken in the transport sector as well. Um, Angus MacDonald. <coughs> Thanks, Commissioner. I'm just, just picking up on, on, on that issue. I have um, some AQMAs in, in my constituency, uh, and it's more a technical question, really, just um, how practical will it be to um, upgrade the AQMA monitors in local areas um, to uh, check for PM2.5? Or is that a fairly straightforward issue? Yes, that's an issue we're looking at at the moment. I mean, we, we already have a fairly extensive network of monitors for, for PM10, which is a slightly larger size fraction. We've got a good spread of those across Scotland, and many of those monitors can be directly modified to introduce a PM2.5 um, monitoring element into them as well. So we're in the process of reviewing the network at the moment to see how many of those existing monitors can be modified in that way. And after that, to identify gaps in the network where we need to introduce completely new monitors. Okay. And do you have a timeline for that? That review should be complete um, in the next two or three months. And then after that, we'll develop a programme for rolling out uh, the new PM2.5 monitoring network. Okay. Thank you. Following on from that, uh, Minister, um, there was recent news about uh, local authorities failing to uh, monitor the uh, effects in particular streets, uh, which was in the press. And um, it seems to me that a lot of the work in this ties up with the monitoring equipment and indeed the use of that. Um, are you co confident that um, the local authorities will be able to cope with these tasks and that uh, they're ready to do so? Um, local authorities, I mean, they with them. Um 
air quality management areas, you know, they do have action plans in place which contain a wide range of actions that are designed to improve uh, local air quality. You know, so the Scottish Government is, you know, working closely with these uh, authorities and other partners to help implement, uh, to help them implement their plans. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. And good morning, uh, Minister, and to your officials. Uh, it, it was partly a follow-on follow from the convener's question, really. Uh, there, there wasn't a, any BRIA or anything, um, and, and it states that in, in, our, in our information that there aren't financial consequences. I was just wondering if there would be co actual costs to local authorities for developing um, further monitoring or where the costs would fall. And also, um, while I appreciate that... Um, there's still a lot of research to be done into fine particulate matter. Um, I, I noted that, um, Andrew Taylor, that uh, you, you said that it was likely to be transport that was causing this, and I, I'm wondering the degree to which it's able to identify um, these very dangerous um, fine particulates and what would actually happen if it's shown that they are exceeding the limit. You know, what, what action would be taken? Let Andrew answer that, set the second part of your question, you. Claudia. Um, on the first part, in terms of the, you know, the financial implications of the new objective, I mean, yes, there is, as I said, as I said previously, you know, there is a need to increase the number of PM 2.5 uh, monitoring stations, but the aim is not to put uh, an additional financial burden on our local authorities, but actually to utilise uh, central government's budgets for this purpose. And where possible, we will certainly um, modify existing uh, monitoring equipment to reduce costs. Yeah, <clears throat> in terms of action that local authorities might actually take, as, as the Minister's um, already said, um, many local authorities already have air quality action plans in place containing a wide range of measures which are, are based on monitoring that's been done for existing pollutants of concern such as PM10, nitrogen dioxide and sulphur dioxide. So by introducing a new pollutant PM2.5 into that process, um, we're simply... Um, we're simply adapting a process that's already well established rather than introducing new, a new requirement for local authorities. And any local authorities that identify a problem with PM2.5 issues in their local area following monit monitoring will, will um, be expected to develop further action plan measures that um, specifically focus on that pollutant. In, in practice, in many cases, a lot of the causes and the solutions for PM2.5 PM10 are the same as they are for PM2.5. So in practice, a lot of local authorities will already be taking action that is going to reduce PM2.5 anyway. But as we've already said earlier, having this subjective in regulations provides a specific focus for addressing that pollutant in itself. Right, thank you. But I'm still not clear what, uh, if, for the record, uh, just for this committee and, and more generally, it would be very helpful for me to understand what sort of action can a local authority take? What, what are we likely to see in these action plans if there are fine particulate matters or, or other um, health affecting particulates that will, um, that, you know, come from transport? Um, well, there's a range of measures that local authorities can take, and obviously it depends on specific local circumstances as to what measures um, authorities may, may decide to take. I mean, clean out, clean out vehicles is a particular example. Local authorities may choose to um, make emissions improvements to their own vehicle fleets. They may um, liaise with bus companies and with um, um, hauliers and um, try and make improvements to the bus fleet and the HGV fleet. They may consider measures that improve traffic flow. They may consider measures that involve restricting um, vehicle access to particular areas at a particular time. There are a range of measures that can be taken, and obviously each um, local authority is going to have a different set of problems. Thank you. Um, Graham Day, then uh, Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Just to follow up on Corey Beamish's point, I just want a, a bit of clarity here because it strikes me that there may be a, a far bigger picture that goes beyond local government, in fact, national government, because I wonder where this sits with the World Health Organization report of about three years ago that identified there was a problem with the filters on modern diesels where it had emerged that these filters had been tested in long-distance uh, scenarios rather than sitting idle and in cities, and it had emerged that these were spitting out particulates to a far greater degree than the older-style diesel filters. If these two things are related, then this is a far bigger picture than anything that uh, a council or a national government could address. I just wonder if there's any tie-up there. <laughs> 
That's a, yeah, no, and Neil, if you want to. I think there's a, a number of actions that can be done. First of all, uh, I don't recall the reports uh, two, three years ago that you refer to, but there is work at the U European Union level uh, around actually vehicle standards and specifying within the single market what is allowed to be uh, manufactured and placed on the roads. Uh, there's been well-profiled uh, discussions about real uh, world emission levels over the last uh, nine months, and that's something that uh, I think the Minister will hear an update on at next week's Environment Council. There's also work that we can do uh, at the Scotland level. Uh, a lot of Andrew's work with colleagues in Transport Scotland and elsewhere across the government is around providing support and tools to local authorities uh, to actually deliver real-world benefits on the ground rather than replicating them 32 times. And one of the things as we move forward to deliver the Clean Air for Scotland strategy, we are working with SEPA to uh, see how they can provide further technical support to actually deliver these targeted local actions. Clear, I'm, I'm not in any way against this at all. I think absolutely need to do it, but I just, it was, for, it was a point of information as to where we thought this issue sat, and it was a World Health Organization report, as it probably maybe three to four years ago. So Dave Thompson. Yeah. You convene that morning, uh, Minister and, and, and officials. Um, of course, electric vehicles have zero emissions, and uh, that's one way to ensure there's no PM 2.5 or anything else for, for that matter. But there still seems to be an awful lot of misinformation or misunderstanding out there. Uh, as the Minister will know, I recently got a, an electric vehicle myself, a Nissan Leaf, and <coughs> uh, I know that there are electric vehicles being used on Mull very effectively on the island, but I saw a lady from Mull being quoted as saying, oh, it would be very good in a city and very good in an island, but on the longer distances, uh, you know, fossil fuels are better. That's not actually true. Uh, I've used my vehicle to drive uh, up and down from Inverness to Edinburgh two or three times now. I went via Fort William just uh, over a week ago. Uh, the only hindrance is the number of rapid charging points, which restricts you a little bit, and you've got to plan well in advance, but that is improving. So local authorities and others and other public bodies could be moving more rapidly, I think, towards electric uh, vehicles. The, the batteries are improving all the time. So if we could put more effort into that, I think, Minister, and I'm interested in your view on this, then that might help to resolve a lot of these issues. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and yes, you know, you do, um, I mean, you're absolutely right, um, Dave Thompson. I think, you know, certainly the government has invested uh, 11 million pounds in the development of the Charge Place uh, Scotland network of electric vehicle charge points, which are now are comprising I think, over um, 400 uh, units, which equates to about over 800 uh, public charging bays, with many more that are being commissioned over uh, the coming months. You know, there's work to provide high-powered rapid chargers on strategic routes connecting uh, Scotland's towns and cities is also continuing. And I think with electric vehicles, you know, these have probably been, we've, we've probably seen more sales, I think, in the past year than we have probably in the past uh, five years uh, put together. Well, never let it be said that the Iraqi committee fails to look at the minutiae of uh, particulates as well as the minutiae of uh, secondary legislation. It's all very interesting. Uh, and uh, hopefully there will be no further questions at the moment for the Minister, in which case we move to agenda item three. The third item today is consideration of motion S4M 15453, asking the committee to recommend approval of Air Quality Scotland Amendment Regulation 2016 draft. The motion is that the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee recommends that the Air Quality Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016 draft be approved. I invite the Minister to speak to and move the motion. I formally moved. Thank you. Um, uh, any members who wish to speak? No? Yes? Sarah uh Boyer? I just want to briefly say that I very strongly support this, um, but I think as has been teased out in the questions from members across the committee, um, although this looks like a really boring statutory instrument, it's potentially quite radical in terms of it adds to the um, monitoring process in our local authority areas. I had a members debate on air quality um, before Christmas. and. The discussions we've been having about bus fleets, lorries, council vehicles and cars, um, we will need to make quite radical changes once we get more monitoring out in our communities. And I know in my patch we have several areas that regularly fail the air quality management 
um, targets. So I think that's why um, I don't think anyone expected us to ask lots of questions, but this statutory instrument needs to be a trigger to wider change in terms of our transport strategies and to support our local authorities cleaning up our air. Thanks, Convener. Any other member wish to comment? No. Uh, Minister, to wind up, if uh, you wish. Quite happy not to do so, Convener. Thank you, then. Well, I'll put the question. The question is that motion S4M15453 in the name of Aileen McLeod be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. And we will record that and uh, we will take a short break to change officials. So, agenda item four, subordinate legislation, and this concerns the reservoirs enforcement, etc. Scotland Order 2016 draft. And we welcome the Minister and her officials, Dr. Aileen MacLeod, Neil Ritchie once again, and at this time Claire Dodd, the reservoirs policy officer. And Minister, do you wish to speak to the instrument, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. And I'm pleased to still be with the committee to support the committee's consideration of the Reservoirs Enforcement etc Scotland Order 2016. Uh, from the 1st of April this year, reservoirs in Scotland with a capacity of 25,000 or more cubic metres will be regulated by SEPA under a new regime provided for in Part 1 of the Reservoirs Scotland Act 2011. Under the new regime, SEPA will regulate each reservoir, taking into account the risk that each reservoir poses to public safety. In particular, SEPA will be responsible for ensuring that reservoir managers comply with the duties imposed on them under the new regime. A number of sections in the 2011 Act have already been commenced and regulations brought into force which create the detailed framework for implementation of the 2011 Act. This order is part of that framework and makes provision for a number of new enforcement measures for SEPA. These enforcement measures will provide SEPA with a better range of interventions so that it can enforce Part 1 of the Act in an effective and proportionate way. So the order will give SEPA the power to serve, first of all, a stop notice to prohibit a, res a reservoir manager from carrying out certain activities until specified steps have been taken. Uh, secondly, a restraint notice to secure that non-compliant acts do not continue or recur. Or lastly, a restoration notice to require steps to be taken to restore the position to what it would have been if previous non-compliant acts had not been committed. Now, these measures are also part of a wider framework of enforcement measures open to SEPA and that they will not be used in isolation. By virtue of separate legislation that has been made under the Regulated Reform Scotland Act 2014, SEPA also has the option of imposing uh, monetary penalties or of accepting enforcement undertakings in relation to specified offences under Part 1 of the 2011 Act. SEPA will also continue to refer significant, persistent and deliberate offending to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service for consideration of whether to prosecute. SEPA is well aware of the significance of the additional powers and responsibilities that we propose to give it, and it is committed to ensuring that the measures are used responsibly. Now, there are safeguards in the order, such as the right of individuals to make written representations and to appeal against enforcement decisions. In particular, SEPA is also required to publish guidance about the use of the powers conferred on it by the order. We do not expect that enforcement measures will be frequently used. They are intended 
to support prevention and proportionate risk management. And I'd ask the committee to support this instrument. Thank you. Um, some various people wish to uh, respond to this. Mike Russell, first of all. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I'm very supportive of the, the, both the legislation and the regulation, but I just want to probe a little bit in terms of both the reservoirs affected mm -hmm. and the costs. Um, the the, you, the a business and regulatory impact assessment says that there's 680 controlled reservoirs of the size being regulated. That's 25,000 or more cubic metres. Of those, 250 are owned by a variety of private estates, individuals, trusts and community groups. Those are the ones that I think I have most concern about, particularly individual ownership, where there is a potential for very considerable necessary expenditure particularly as I think it's an open secret that the 1975 Act was more honoured in the breach than the observance in the sense that there were some reservoirs uh, and we know that because of incidents that took place in 2008 and 2009 if I'm right uh, these reservoirs were not well maintained. Is there an estimate of how many of these reservoirs require uh, work to be done? Is there an estimate of what that will cost and is there an estimate of what SEPA will have to do to make that happen? Because I, I find it difficult to believe that there will not be a significant cost and some of that cost will, will, will fall upon bodies which pro probably do not have the assets to undertake those repairs. So I think this is more complex than it appears. It will have to be done, but I fear that the government in the end may have to step in. Claire, do you have the details? Um, I, I don't have the details. Um, I mean, I suppose that the BRIA was about this order. Um, I mean, all, all the, the reservoirs are under the, the 75 Act. Um, I mean, there isn't that many changes. You know, the, a high-risk one still has to have a, um, a sort of a supervising engineer in place at all times, has to have its 10 yearly inspection report. And that was the same under the 1975 Act. Um, I'm not aware that um, there's, there's sort of outstanding um, issues regards the... I mean, I'm happy to, to have a conversation mm -hmm. about this, but I seem to recall that an incident in uh, Neil Johnston, uh, somewhere in Renfrewshire, resulted in the discovery that there was no uh, supervising engineer who could be contacted and a recognition that there were perhaps in the lower category of reservoirs, the 10,000 to 25,000 cubic metres, there were likely to be quite a number of those reservoirs where a supervising engineer might exist, but had in actual fact not been involved for a very long period of time. My worry about this is not the legislation or the regulation. The worry is that there, uh, there is a likelihood of a discovery of significant numbers of reservoirs where the resources are not great enough in order to do the work that is required. And I think I'm simply raising the issue because I think it will require attention from the government at some stage. By definition, you don't know these things until something happens. The second point, if I might, you know, just to make the point that I think there are likely to be some burdens in terms of reservoirs that are parts of properties for sale. I know of one case in my own constituency where the sale has been considerably delayed because of worry about this legislation and about what it might mean. Now, I, I think the legislation is the right thing to do, but I do think we should also consider that there are issues where some reservoirs may continue to deteriorate because they cannot be sold, because there are burdens which are now being applied which cannot be met. And again, it would require, because it's a matter of public safety, it would require intervention from the Scottish Government, because local authorities will be very reluctant to do so. And this legislation does sort of, doesn't sideline local authorities, but it takes them away from the centre of the attention. No, we're certainly happy to bear that in mind. I mean, I think um, Mr Russell makes a number of, uh, I think, very good uh, points for us to uh, consider further. Yeah. I might yes. just add, add further. Uh, I'm not aware, as Claire said, of any significant problem. We're happy to have that discussion uh, with Mr Russell. It would probably be helpful to involve uh, SEPA in any such discussion, mm -hmm. given actually their operational engagement uh, with it. What we're talking about here effectively is actually the, the cost of maintaining and running reservoirs, which should be done in respect to the legislation in place. And what we're talking about today is the, the regulations that help us deliver and enforce that and avoid those problems emerging. But we are conscious that, and it's not just specific to reservoirs, there are a number of areas involved where CEPA get involved in where they're 
uh, can be uh, ongoing liability issues associated with um, abandoned sites and that is something that we are very actively working uh, on as part of our better environmental regulation work in particular to try and avoid happening in the first place. There's no point in finding people who can't afford to, to do the basic maintenance work. I mean, that just makes the situation worse. But I'd be grateful for a conversation with them, at, with SEPA and with the Scottish Government to ensure that, that there's a recognition that some of these problems exist. Okay. Uh, Graham Day. Thank you. Just a point of information. If we accept Mike Russell's point about the resources that may be available at the smaller reservoirs, it strikes me that the greater risk might lie there. So can I ask why this is being done in a staged way with the reservoirs of between 10 and 25,000 cubic metres uh, coming into this regime at some point in the future? And could, it, could we ask for an indication of when that would be? Well, certainly, certainly under, I mean, under obviously the old regime, all the reservoirs, the capacity of 25,000 cubic metres or more, you know, of water were regulated in a similar way. And I think under the new regime, obviously, SIPA will assess the risk that each reservoir poses and that, you know, those that pose a greater risk will be inspected uh, more frequently and be more closely uh, regulated. And obviously, we've said that from the 1st of April this year, that SIPA will assume the full um, responsibility for the regulation of reservoirs with the capacity of greater than 25,000 uh, cubic metres. Now, I think it's at some point in the future, and maybe um, uh, Neil Ritchie can clarify, but the regime may be extended to also regulate for the first time reservoirs with a capacity of between uh, 10,000 and the 25,000 uh, cubic metres. Yeah. Um, thank you, Minister. When we uh, introduced the Act through the Parliament 2011, we were very clear that we were focusing on the existing regulated regime of 25,000 cubic metres, uh, which we thought was the, the greater uh, opportunity and potential risk. Uh, once we've actually got that regime in place, we'll be looking uh, towards extending it. I can't give a precise timing uh, at this point in time because that is a discussion that we will need to be having with wider stakeholders, including uh, individual uh, operators of the, these smaller reservoirs, but there is the intention to expand this uh, and one of the also issues we need to take into account will be the resourcing required to do this because it will be, has been a quite an extended process to do all the required mapping to understand the risks uh, of and identify which category the 25,000 cubic metre uh, reservoirs fit within. So can I ask just for, do we know roughly how many of the smaller reservoirs exist in Scotland? No. Not a, a firm figure. Uh, we didn't have a firm figure for the 25,000 cubic metres yeah. until last year when the registration process um, had been undertaken. If I recall correctly, uh, when we went through the uh, uh, reservoirs bill, uh, our initial estimate was around five to 600 reservoirs, but uh, 600 at that point we thought was the upper end of the spectrum. Okay, thank you. Claudia Beamish. Vina, uh, I'd like to ask you, Minister, about whether there's um, been any assessment or likely to be any assessment of the relationship between um, more extreme weather events and these reservoirs, uh, mainly because constituents have raised um, issues with me about reservoirs in South Scotland, but uh, I understand from SEPA that this was in relation to misinformation um, that, that was, was rumours rather than fact, and that's been clarified for my constituents. But I do think there is an issue there, and I, I suspect it doesn't fit specifically within the regulation and enforcement, but obviously the risk issue fits somewhere. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the, I mean, the 2011 Act, and I'll answer your question in two parts, I mean, the 2011 Act, I mean, that actually requires SEPA to establish and maintain a public controlled um, reservoirs registers, which uh, includes um, flood maps. Now, these reservoir flood maps show the area of land that is likely uh, to be flooded in the event of an uncontrolled uh, release of water from a reservoir. And that relates to the very low likelihood situation of a, you know, a structure or structures that are completely uh, failing. Now, the main purpose of the maps was really was to assist SEPA in assigning a, a risk designation to each reservoir as required by the 2011 Act. And obviously the risk of water escaping from a reservoir is extremely low and there'd be no major um, 
dam failures uh, in the UK since the advent of the first reservoir safety uh, legislation in 1930. But we know that reservoirs can be used for um, flood storage purposes. An example of that is St Mary's Lock um, in the Scottish Borders, which is part of the Selkirk Flood Protection Scheme. And that can be used to store water during uh, a flood event. And the works, actually, at St Mary's Lock helped um, Selkirk to avoid the worst of uh, flooding damage that was caused by um, Storm Desmond uh, last December. But I think, you know, taking water out of a, a reservoir can be a, a complex matter and reservoirs, you know, certainly in general, are not managed as a flood defence. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, um, then that's fine. I think we can now move on to agenda item five. Uh, and this agenda item is to consider the motion S4M15450 and ask the committee to recommend approval of reservoirs, enforcements, etc. Scotland Order 2016 draft. The motion is that the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee recommends that the reservoirs, enforcements, etc. Scotland Order 2016 draft be approved. I invite the Minister to speak to and move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you. Any members who wish to speak? No. Uh, and therefore, just a formal wind up, Minister. Happy to proceed. Thank you. Uh, I put the question on the motion. The motion is that S4M15450 in the name of Aileen McLeod be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Uh, I will record that and uh, thank you. We will confirm the outcome of the debate. So thank you, Minister, and your officials. And uh, we will now move on to agenda item five. The sixth item on the agenda is for the committee to consider seven negative instruments as listed on the agenda. The Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004 Authorised Operations Order 2016 SSI 2016-38 the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-39. Uh, the Waste Management Licensing Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-40. The Reservoirs at Scotland Regulation 2016, SSI uh, 2016-43. Uh, the Carbon Accounting Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-46. The Orkney Islands Landing of Crabs and Lobsters Order 2016, SSI 2016-50. And the Croft House Grant Scotland Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-63. Uh, now, I refer members to the paper, and I'm going to go through each one in turn and ask if there is any comment to be made. So, any comments on the Nature Conservation uh, Scotland Act 2004? No comments. Okay. The Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations? No comments. Uh, the Waste Management Licensing Scotland Amendment Regulations? No comment. The Reservoir Scotland Regulations 2016? No comments. The Carbon Accounting Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulation 2016. No comments. The Orkney Islands Landing of Crabs and Lobsters Order 2016. Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. It was just really a, a quick point on the uh, velvet crabs, the egg-bearing female velvet crabs. Uh, it... Uh, it states in relation to this order that uh, it only applies to British fishing boats, and I know we have discussed similar things in the past, uh, <coughs> and, and it appears here that uh, the prescribed minimum landing sizes in the prohibition set out in Article 6 apply only to landings from British fishing boats, and these relate to egg-bearing female velvet crabs. It does say uh, that the reason for that is that while foreign fishing boats are therefore exempted, records show they do not make land landings of velvet crab, green crab or lobster into the Orkney Islands. But the point is, do they fish there and are they actually catching egg-bearing female velvet crabs? And I just wondered if that was something we could pursue with, with government uh, you know, uh, to, to establish whether that's the case and, and, and why these exemptions exist. 
Certainly following that up and looking at the map, um, the question ought to be added to uh, is do they fish within the areas shown on the map, which is the areas that this order reflects? Um, and if we can write to the Minister about that, we can try to find out. Any other points in this one? If not, then we move on to the Croft House Grant Scotland regulations. Mike Russell. Dave I Thompson. might make a point of uh, I'm very pleased with these and I think they will assist crofters um, and, and would-be crofters within my own constituency. I, I presume there will be an assurance that the administration of the scheme will continue to be undertaken from Tyree because it is important that it is done within the Highland areas and very welcome to see a diversification of work into uh, and Scottish Ireland, the one uh, within my own constituency. So I'd like assurance. Uh, right I'd just that. like to make sure that that is, continues to be the case. We will write about that. Yes. Dave Thompson. Thank you very much. Uh, equally, I very much welcome uh, these proposals. It's a, it's a huge step forward and uh, it was long overdue, but um, I'm really pleased the government have moved down this road. Uh, the guidance is obviously going to be quite uh, crucial and uh, uh, the, the information here does say we'll get that guidance before the regulations come into force. They come into force on the 1st of April um, and it would be quite useful if we could see that guidance sooner rather than later because it's really important to see exactly who is going to be eligible, for instance, for the higher level of grant, uh, uh, those on the, the mainland uh, parts of the Crofting counties in particular. I'd echo the remarks of my colleagues as a, a MSP with Crofting um, uh, areas. <clears throat> and as you know, during the Land Reform Bill, we talked about uh, potentially eco-friendly designs for houses and it would seem to me that with the kind of regulations that are coming forward we'd expect in parallel that um, the Crofting Commission uh, would be uh, working on such things in order to help modular approaches to help that would allow people to actually build houses that were cheaper and much more fuel efficient. Uh, so I hope that uh, this now that's on the record will keep that particular line going. Uh, as well, but uh, as you say, it's very welcome. Any other comments on those? If not, uh, then I ask the committee, are we agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? We are agreed. Thank you very much. At the next meeting of the committee, we will host two roundtable sessions with stakeholders ahead of the consideration of the committee's legacy report, as well as considering subordinate legislation and petitions. I now close the public part of the meeting and the committee will move into private session as agreed earlier in the meeting. So we now need to clear the gallery. Thank you. <laughs>